there are 10 things that you can do or not do in order to make therapy succeed or fail. And in this episode, we're going to break those down with my guest, who is a therapist. Plus, we talk about the goal of therapy and our tendency to idolize healing. We also talk about a simple tool that you can use. My guest shares a simple tool that you can use to deal with troubling thoughts. We also talk about how all of us experience that struggle of putting into words our emotions and our wounds. You're also just going to get some really awesome quotes from this episode. And we also talk about what to do if you're dealing with a situation where you're not happy with your current therapist. And so if you've ever been to therapy and it didn't go very well, or maybe you're considering going to therapy and you want to make the most of it, this episode is for you. You're really going to benefit from the content in it. And so stay with us. Welcome to the Restored Podcast, helping you heal and grow from the trauma of your parents' divorce, separation, or broken marriage, so you can feel whole again and break the cycle. I'm your host, Joey Panarelli, and this is episode 110. We're so thrilled that so many of you have found this podcast helpful and even healing for tons of feedback. Graziella said this. She said, just listen to the podcast, and it's great. I hope many young people will listen. I wish I would have had resources like this when I was growing up. Karen said this, she said, what an excellent podcast. I've listened to three episodes so far, and I can relate to so much of this. There's so much isolation with being a child of divorce, and I feel I've found a community with this podcast. Again, we're so happy that we've been able to guide you, to help you in your journey. And if you want to tell us how we've been able to help you, we'd love to hear it. Just go to restoredministry.com slash testimony. Again, restoredministry.com slash testimony, or just click on the link in the show notes. My guest today is Claire Eckerd. Claire is a psychotherapist with a master's degree in clinical mental health counseling from Franciscan University of Steubenville with two concentrations, crisis and trauma counseling and Christian counseling. She works at St. Raphael Counseling with teens and adults presenting with various mental health struggles. Uh, the team of therapists at St. Raphael Counseling serves individuals ages four and up, as well as couples, families across the Front Range area of Colorado with telehealth and in-person options. Uh, St. Raphael Counseling also provides testing for students who may have a learning attention or autism spectrum disorder. And so in this episode, we do talk about God and faith. And if you don't believe in God, you're totally welcome here. Anyone who's been listening to this podcast for a while knows that this is not a strictly religious podcast. And so wherever you're at, I'm glad that you're here. If you don't believe in God, again, if you were to take out the God parts, if you're going to take out the faith parts, you're still going to benefit from this episode. And so my challenge to you would be just listen with an open mind. And again, I know you're going to benefit from it. And so with that, here's my chat with Claire. Claire, it's so good to have you on the show. Welcome. Thank you so much. It's an honor be, honor to be here. Likewise, honored to, to have you. I uh, I want to go into your backstory a little bit, but starting out, I'm just curious, why did you become a therapist? Mm, million dollar question. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so it really was a calling, which like in faith terms is like, yeah, that movement in my heart for... Um, God just wanting to use my talents in this way and that passion to serve others in this way. And it really took a few years to take the leap to go to grad school because I was honestly kind of intimidated by it Um, and just the ideas in my head of what I thought it would be like. But the doors just kept opening. So here I am and I'm really happy. Beautiful. I love it. And tell me a little bit about your training and maybe the type of therapy that you do now. So You went to my alma mater, Franciscan University, for grad school. Is that right? Yeah. And yeah, it's a clinical mental health counseling program is what it's called. Um, So we're accredited by the state. um, And then we're also a Catholic university. It's actually kind of the only in-person Catholic, like authentically Catholic university that has this kind of program, um, which is why I chose it. Um, And they also had a concentration in crisis and trauma and Christian counseling, which was really neat as well. Beautiful. Okay. I love that. And in your work now, is there a particular therapy model that you follow 
or how does that work? I'm not a therapist. So you're talking to a lay person here, but I'm just curious. Um, yeah, kind of what you're doing today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I mostly use cognitive behavioral therapy, which I'm sure you've heard of. Um, most people that have taken a psychology class or gone to therapy have heard of it because it's one of the most popular um, theories used and it's been around um, about the longest and just has a lot of research backing it. Um, and I really love to use it because a lot of it is like getting to the heart of the issue and unpacking what's true and what might feel true, but not actually be true. And and I also just find it really compatible for people that, um, yeah, are living a Christian faith or Catholic faith and want to make sure that the whatever theory we're using is compatible with their faith. And since so much of it is unpacking the truth, it's it's really compatible. Very cool. And uh, I know some people just think of uh, cognitive behavioral therapy as just like talk therapy, but it sounds like there's more to it than just that. And th there is a difference, I think, between like our worldview and our experience of the world. I I heard um, Bessel van der Kirk, who wrote the book, The Body Keeps the Score, talk about this recently in a podcast episode. He was basically saying that, you know, it's a good thing to have a worldview, like what you believe is true about the world, like, you know, being a Christian or if you're Jewish, whatever, like you have a worldview, even, you know, atheists have worldviews. But he said more important to that is how you respond to the world. And so much of how you respond to the world comes down to really the brokenness, the trauma that you've experienced and the virtues that you've developed. And so um, I thought that was really profound and interesting. And so I love how you're able to kind of help people align their worldview with their kind of response to the world. Yeah. Wow. I love that. I might use that. <laughs> Please do. I, I wish I could say I came up with it, but I didn't. But I um, I wanted to go into your story as well. So I'm just curious, what's been your experience with with trauma, with brokenness, and in healing? Yeah. No. Also, a great question. Um, and totally has a lot of layers. But basically, long story short, is um, yeah, I had an eating disorder starting end of middle school into high school, a little bit into college. And didn't really know that therapy was an option for me. Um, just didn't have the knowledge, like, that it was a resource um, and know if it was a trusted resource. So I was very skeptical of it um, for different reasons. Um, but uh, praise God, a priest <laughs> directed me to go to a counselor that happened to be free at school at Ave Maria's where I did my undergrad. And yeah, it was super life-changing. <laughs> and and actually, my first therapist wasn't the most impactful, but it was finally a space where I felt like I could be understood, which was new because I didn't really understand what was why I couldn't stop when I wanted to stop some behaviors. Um, but it was actually my second therapist <laughs> who really, really changed my life um, and was able to just speak into my story and help me understand myself and how I could make steps towards change and freedom and healing. Um, yeah, I remember at the time thinking like this kind of little small voice, like maybe I could do this someday, but probably not. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Wow. Beautiful. Okay. So you had this um, transformational experience that eventually led to you wanting to help other people have those same transformations, which is really, really beautiful. Before we go deeper there, I am curious about kind of that experience of waking up to the fact that you had this problem, this disorder. I am curious, like, did you have language to put to that disorder out of the gate? Did you realize like, oh, I'm, I'm struggling with an eating disorder. This is what it's called sort of thing. And the reason I asked that question is I remember, you know, when my parents split when I was really young and then later, or not really young, I was, you know, 11, around 11 years old. And then in the years that followed, especially in the high school, having experiences of um, anxiety and even depression, and I didn't have the language to put to those things. So I didn't actually know what I was experiencing. Um, I don't even know how I thought about it, but I just knew I just didn't feel right. That was kind of the way that I would talk about it. And so um, eventually got the language and was able to recognize, wow, okay, I'm dealing with kind of intense anxiety or maybe a little bit of OCD here and some depression and all those different things. So I'm just curious if you were able to kind of pinpoint the language and if not, when that occurred. Yeah, totally. I have a lot of thoughts from what you said, but I'll start with, 
I think that experience is what most people come to therapy with. Like, I know something's mm. wrong and I know whatever I've tried is not working. And I just need help from someone who might understand more. And I think that's probably mostly how I came to therapy. I did. I do remember like in middle school, we learned about eating disorders in my like guidance class. And I remember asking a friend like, I wonder, like, do I have this? <laughs> and she's like, no, no, no. Like, you would know if you had it. And then I was like, okay. Mm. <laughs> but I think a lot of maybe, yeah, what was going on inside me emotionally, like, I didn't know how to vocalize how I was feeling. So I think a lot of what I learned was, whoa, I have emotions, and they're neither good nor bad. They just are. And um, it's okay to have them. And I have emotional needs. And I can, like in your book, you talk about like, how do we choose healthy coping? And I really had to learn what that meant and that I was just choosing really unhealthy coping. Yeah, no, it's easy to do. And I can relate to with a lot of what you said. And I love that you said that about kind of people entering to, into therapy often with that sense of like, something's not right, but I don't totally know how to talk about it. And I think there is so much freedom in working with a therapist like yourself who can help you, you know, first kind of grow this awareness, recognize what you're dealing with, in a sense, diagnose the problem. And then once you've done that, then you can, like you said, do all some coping strategies and then hopefully also work on healing maybe the root cause of it so that it either disappears the problem or becomes a much more manageable thing to, to go through. So I, I love that you said all of that and man, there's so much we can talk about there. I, any further thoughts before we move on? Um, yeah, I mean, there's so much more we can talk about. I think I just like that you use the word manage. Cause I think often people come in like wanting to fix the problem or wanting to get rid of anxiety, but anxiety, like everyone has it even like the perfect mother of God had was anxious when she couldn't find her son. And it's really more about how can I manage this better and, and learn more about myself so that I can do that. Yeah, no. And I think those, um, those tactics are so important. And I do think, I do think there is hope that in some scenarios, I think, I don't think every wound can be healed to like a hundred percent, but I've seen evidence that there are, there is the possibility of even going beyond the management um, but what often I think needs to happen, like you're saying, is like we need to at least get some sort of like, you know, handle on the situation, some sort of, like you said, coping mechanisms to like make it through. Um, and then hopefully we can go from that just like surviving or um, kind of getting by to then, you know, thriving. And so maybe, um, yeah, would you talk about that a little bit? I'm just curious kind of what you've seen in your life too. Can wounds be completely healed or is that kind of a pipe dream? Maybe that is too wishful. Ooh, I like this. Um, uh, this is a very interesting question. I think the way I usually conceptualize it based on my own journey and just people I work with is like, there's still a scab usually. But I mean, we also in our bodies, there's like wounds that. that don't have scabs. So I think maybe some things like do really become a part of your past that you, yeah, there's no scab. It just is something you worked through. But I think the way I usually think about it, especially with mental health struggles, is like there usually is a scab. Because <laughs> even like um, like compulsive behaviors such as eating disorder, like if you have struggled and learned how to use it as an unhealthy coping, it is still something that you might be tempted to do again. And you just have to kind of be aware. I have that scab. It's been healed. But if I find myself needing to cope emotionally, I need to be vigilant of like, what is healthy coping? And if I slip up, what supports do I have? What do I need to do to get back on track? That's good. And that makes a lot of sense. And I do think different wounds can be treated differently. And I do think you've probably seen this too. Some therapists or therapy models are more effective at treating certain things than others. And I like to use the analogy of the medical world or our physical bodies when we're trying to heal them. So, you know, there are situations where if you were to break your wrist or your arm, that can be completely healed. Now there is, there's going to be the tissue that builds up. I, I don't know. I can't think of the name, the, um, the fractured, like 
bone or the tissue essentially that, you know, develops in response to the broken bone, which actually can make it right stronger if I'm getting that right. I'm not a doctor or a therapist, um, as you can tell. But yeah, I think I think there's some to be said for that. But the way that I like to think about healing is in the Google definition of healing, which is like the process of becoming like healthy and whole. And I think that does look different in different situations. So I do think in certain situations, maybe a wound can be healed to the point where you don't even recognize it was there in the at all to begin with. Whereas others, like you said, there is maybe a continual like scar or scab. Um, whereas others, there might be a continual limp because it's something we just haven't figured out yet how to heal. And that's where maybe I'm a little um, idealistic in my thinking about healing because I think there conceptually potentially is a way to heal all these things, um, but maybe we just haven't figured it out yet. Or I, I don't know, you know, what you think about that, but I think there is the potential in the future, maybe that we, for example, come up with better models. And I've seen some of them to heal trauma and that work better than things we've done in the past and almost maybe eliminate or make it, like you said, way more manageable to deal with, with that trauma. So I, I don't know if that's making sense, but um, yeah, curious what you think about that. Yeah, I it's actually funny you bring up like the kind of idealism of healing because I remember in yeah. my internship, which I did at Franciscan for students, um, I used to write in my treatment plans like the goal is to like reduce the anxiety or reduce. And my supervisor was like, that's when he was like, no, it's not. It's to manage um, because mm -hmm. um to reduce, like it kind of creates this sometimes impossible standard. And I'm trying to think of like, it's hard to talk in general generalities because I'm yeah. trying to think of some specifics, but like, especially related to emotions, because a lot of mental health stuff is all related to like our thoughts, emotions and behaviors. And it's like, we're just never going to get rid of even negative emotions. Like they're always going to be part of the human experience. I totally agree with that. Yeah. And that makes sense about, you know, especially very common experiences. I think um, kind of what I've seen, and I love that we're kind of, you know, going around this topic um, and kind of poking at it because it, it's an important one. And I like that you said kind of the idealism of, you know, healing, because I think it, we can fall into that. Um, but I think there is, it, it is really interesting to see kind of some things seem to be able to be healed more than others. Um, and others, maybe not as much. And I think of like, you know, stage four cancer um, is obviously maybe so far progressed that it would be really, really difficult. Maybe in the future, we'll come up with a way to heal that, perhaps, I don't know. Um, but right now, that would be maybe not possible to heal. Whereas, you know, breaking your, like I said before, you know, breaking your ankle or something, um, we could get to a point where that's healed to almost as if it didn't occur to begin with. But at the same time, I like what you're saying, when you have these experiences, these emotions that are just like a normal part of human life, we can't like chop those out, nor would we want to. And so I think that's um, that's an important point that you made, and I'm, I'm glad that you made it as well. I, um, I also just wanted to touch on a little bit about um, just the importance, going back to what we were talking before, of being able to put your emotions and experiences into words. Um, that seems to be so much of the point of therapy, like we were saying before. And I remember reading Dr. Susan David's book, Emotional Agility, um, really benefited from that book. And one of the things that she talks about is just how important it is to put your emotions into words. And she even talks about alexithymia, which for anyone listening who doesn't know, it's like the inability to distinguish between and put into words your own emotions. And that inability greatly handicaps you. It greatly holds you back from being able to manage or you know cope with things and even maybe to move beyond them to close that chapter in your life. Um, and so I think there's a lot of beauty to that. And so I do want to uh, transition into kind of talking about therapy. Like how do you make therapy um, effective? How do you make it productive? How do you make it fruitful? Um, or whatever word you would use to, you know, talk about it. So I'm curious there, um, let's start with the negatives. Like how do you guarantee that therapy like won't work? Yeah, I think the only time it won't work is if you don't show up, <laughs> if you schedule an appointment and don't go. And sometimes it might take scheduling a few times before you get the courage to go. Because, I mean, you and me both have been in therapy and it can be like not something you want to do. <laughs> and I think showing up sometimes is all you can do. And sometimes 
maybe you show up for a while and that's all you can do. And then maybe eventually, hopefully, <laughs> you can start to open up and get comfortable and realize this like is worth investing and this is worth being vulnerable for. Um, and it, it's worth trying to understand myself better so that I can move more towards healing. That's really good. Yeah. And so that's a great way to guarantee that therapy won't work if you don't show up. Um, and I guess, I don't know if we want to go through these and do just the flip side of it, but I guess we're going through like what would contribute to making it helpful and healing. So we could, I guess, do both at the same time. So showing up, that's the first one. Um, what else would you say is an ingredient or factor in making therapy successful? Successful? Yeah. Um, I think like being honest and humble, like just having the space where you can even just be honest, like, I don't know what's going on <laughs> or I don't know if this makes sense, but this is my best guess. Like something we'll say as therapist is like, just give me your best guess. Like try your best to describe this. And maybe I can fill in some gaps based off of other people with similar experiences in my education. Yeah. But I think, oh, another point on that is <laughs> One of my favorite professors from grad school, um, he said, and um, he's not Catholic or anything, um, but like awesome professor. He said, like, there's such humility that comes with therapy. Like, it's a great act of humility, which is a virtue. It's the crown of all virtues. So I think knowing that just the act of therapy um, is helping you grow in virtue and honesty, humility, and, and many others. Courage can help encourage you on the way. Um, yeah. I like that. Okay. So we have, so far we have just showing up. We have being honest. So, so telling the truth. Um, we have being humble. So not being like egotistical or prideful. And then we have being courageous is another one that I wrote down. Um, so to flip them on the, their head, if you don't show up. <laughs> if you lie and you're not honest, if you are super prideful and arrogant and don't want to admit, you know, to a weakness or a wound. And if you kind of shy back from going into the hard things, meaning you're not being courageous, you're being cowardly, it won't work. <laughs> so, um, but, but if you do those things, it, it will work. Another one I was thinking of, which you alluded to, um, and, and even said, I think is the, just the vulnerability component. And that goes along with every, the other ones that you said, but just like this willingness to kind of be open and to spill out your heart, just being like, yeah, Hey, this is where I'm at. And I found such freedom there in my life, especially when it comes to therapy, but also with just mentors of mine who are able to, you know, kind of walk with me through really difficult things. I think we all fear, being completely vulnerable with someone um, because we think that if they saw how broken we were, they wouldn't love us. They wouldn't want us. They wouldn't, you know, give us any sort of time and attention or love. And what I've found is with, with, if you pick the right people to be vulnerable with, uh, it actually makes them love and respect you more because it takes an incredible amount of courage, like you said, to be able to to open up um, that, that much. So yeah, I'm curious what you've seen in your own life going to therapy, but also being a therapist when it comes to vulnerability, how important is that? Yeah. I love the topic of vulnerability and learned a lot from Brene Brown's book, Daring Greatly, um, on vulnerability. Um, I don't agree with everything she says, but I think she does a good job of like explaining it and explaining like how to do it well. And I think like what you described as like it being scary or fearful to share with someone. Um, I think a lot of that comes from like real experiences when you try and maybe what you're sharing is too uncomfortable for someone they don't understand or they haven't had experiences with that themselves. So they just really don't have the words or maybe there's judgment or things that might make you feel feel really fearful to do that again because it might have been painful. Therapy, hopefully, I mean, not every therapist is perfect. It's also humans doing it, but hopefully it can be that space where you can know that this professional is someone I can trust and someone who's not going to judge me and someone who is going to validate my experience and help me understand it further. Um, and hopefully they're, I mean, they're usually an empathetic person. Otherwise they shouldn't have made it to grad school. <laughs> <laughs> so good. No, um, 
so much to say there, but I do want to touch on something where I think everyone kind of leaned in when you said it is that um, therapists are human too. And not all therapists are created equal. You said that before as well. And, you know, the first therapist you had was helpful, but it wasn't as impactful. And so I'm curious about that. Like, what do you do if you're in the, in the seat of being the one going to therapy and maybe you're with a therapist who doesn't seem to be kind of working out for you or you're not really, maybe they're not treating in the way that you would hope. What would you advise for someone in that situation to to do? Yeah, great question. Um, and I'll start with, I think, coming to therapy with an open mind is is really mm-hmm. important because I've seen some people, and I kind of was this myself, like coming with an agenda or like being skeptical of therapy and so quickly judging like, oh, the therapist isn't for me or counseling can't work because I can't find the right therapist. And I just encourage you to persevere and have an open mind and Try a therapist and be willing to admit, like, if you feel like, do I feel comfortable sharing anything with this person? And and it might take a little bit of time to build trust because even though they are a professional, yeah, they still are a human and it takes time to build trust just like in any relationship, um, but usually a little quicker in this professional relationship. So I think being open-minded and tuning into like your experience and if it's, if you're feeling like okay, this isn't helpful anymore. Um, That's a good time to be like, um, is it because I am maybe feeling more confident and don't need therapy right now? Or is it because I want to try another therapist? Um, Which is so real because sometimes it's even just the personality you don't jive well with and that might prohibit you from getting the therapy you need. Yeah, I love that. There's so much freedom there. And I think that's good. And so in that situation, what's something maybe someone could say to that therapist that they're working with um, instead of maybe just like ghosting them and never showing up again? Um, I'm curious because I think there's probably a right way to do that and a wrong way to do to kind of break the relationship or say like, hey, this isn't really working for me. So what would work well in that situation if someone maybe listening right now is finding themselves in a situation where they want to try a different therapist? Yeah, I mean... I don't know if there's necessarily a right or wrong way. Like often people do just ghost. <laughs> I mean, not often, but sometimes. And and like we understand as therapists, but I think what might be courteous, because um, it's still a relationship and like as a therapist, like I care about all my clients. <laughs> um, so like if someone says like, hey, like I'm, I don't need to schedule another appointment or like I'm going to cancel and I, I'm not interested in continuing therapy at this time. Like that's, that's enough. And if you want to share more, feel free. And I think, yeah, I mean, if anyone ever says like kind things to me, that does, it means a lot, you know, because I care about that person. So yeah, know that your words um, can mean a lot to a therapist. Um, But also if you feel like this wasn't a good experience and I just want it to be done, (laughs) um, like just being direct and short and clear is enough, I'd say. Okay. That's good advice. Yeah, I like that. And I've had therapists in the past where just, yeah, there was something off, like we weren't clicking. Um, so had to move on. Uh, at the same time, there was a therapist. I remember when I was at Franciscan, I was working with uh, him there. And yeah, it took me maybe like nine months to like a year. I did a year and a half of therapy when I was at Franciscan um, in, in college for anyone who doesn't know Franciscan University. But basically, I, um, yeah. It took me probably like a year or so to really get to like the deep stuff, which probably means that I'm just like slow and prideful, <laughs> but, uh, but it took me that long. So I think sometimes, like you were saying before, it could just mean you haven't progressed to that point yet, or you're not maybe willing to take that risk and kind of open up and, and be, be more vulnerable than maybe you have been in the past, um, because you're scared and I totally get being scared. I mean, I know you get that too, Claire. Yeah. And I think part of it totally could be that, but it could also just be like therapy can kind of be this almost new language of like talking yeah. about my feelings. And maybe I've never done that before. <laughs> and maybe I haven't even tuned into what I am feeling. Like sometimes mm. we go through life just thinking, okay, I get angry, sad and happy. And <laughs> I don't even have words for other emotions. And there's so many. So like a lot of a lot of where people start that I've seen is like just tuning into emotions and thoughts and getting comfortable with that habit so that I can then know 
how to meet my needs and know what I need to do and mm-hmm. um, know if I'm engaging in unhelpful or true thoughts and become more aware of that. And also like this is kind of back to a point you had earlier, um, but when we're able to develop that language to describe ourselves too, it then gives us the language to tell those people we know and love and trust and and to the more you know someone, the more you can love them. So it really gives people the opportunity to love you better when you're able to articulate <laughs> what's going on better. No, I love that. That's such an excellent point. Going back to the, um, yeah, this whole idea of like, how do you make therapy successful or sabotage it on the flip side is um, the homework. Like often therapy sessions will end with something you need to do or think about, right? And so I think it's obviously very important to to do that homework, but I'm curious if you'd talk a little bit more about that and if there's any other things you think that make therapy fruitful, successful or not. Yeah, I like just the two terms of like implement and invest. So I think Mm. checking like your level of investment, like am I making time not just for my hour long or 50 minute therapy session? Like am I also making time to process and learn healthy coping and have space if I need it to deal with what I'm dealing with. Um, and, then, and am I making that a priority? So am I invested one? And then two, am I implementing it? Because like, you're not going to get much out of it if you're just like listening in the therapy session, but not <laughs> implementing what you're talking about. Like, you might be in a therapy a long time before it gets effective. So I think Um, And implementing doesn't have to take a lot of time. It's just more, yeah, like that tuning into my emotions and thoughts and those needs and um, other, there's a whole, I could go off on on all of that. Um, But I think that, and then, yeah, something else I just wanted to mention was um, support. So whether that's from friends, like I think the more you can, Like, it's so great that you're opening up to someone, like your therapist, but it's even better if you could start also opening up more to friends and and maybe support groups, like depending on what you're struggling with, those might be good. Um, Yeah, because for different struggles, sometimes your friends don't really understand and you might need a support group of other people who do understand what you're going through to really not feel alone. And it's crazy how if people have support how much more efficient therapy is like how much more quickly the healing process goes talk about that a little bit that's fascinating i I love everything that you said i I totally agree with that but yeah um about it being quicker and i don't know if easier would be a word we'd throw in there maybe not but um quicker yeah i'm really curious about that yeah and this is kind of my own theory, <laughs> so take okay. it with a grain of salt, but... Um, this isn't a PhD dissertation. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> um, but I think, like, the goal of therapy is to teach you skills for your own life so you don't need a therapist. And not that you won't never need it again, but, like, it's a tool. Like, the point isn't that you're in therapy the rest of your life, but, <laughs> like, I really see it as something you need and then you learn and then you don't need Um, And I think a huge part of that is being able to communicate your emotional needs with friends and family and other supports. And once you're able to do that, like your need for a therapist, depending on what you're struggling with, could decrease. And, And then like if you're having a bad day, like you have that healthy coping of like, I can call this friend and they can speak truth into maybe my thought spiral or my overthinking and it it really gives yeah just that opportunity for love and truth to be spoken and for you to know you're not alone like even that knowing you're not alone can alleviate so much weight of mental health struggles yeah oh 100 percent. i mean there's so many bad things that happen when we're isolated as humans i mean it's People, a lot of people have talked about this, but it's so interesting that one of the worst punishments that you can endure if you're in prison is solitary confinement because there's basically a misery maybe no greater than that. And I know all the introverts are like, well, maybe that wouldn't be so bad. It's like, no, that would be miserable <laughs> even if you're an introvert. Um, but wow, so many good things, Claire. Um, just to kind of summarize the last few points that we talked about is like be open-minded. 
going into therapy of maybe trying different things. Um, if you want to guarantee it won't work, be closed minded, be, you know, hard headed. Um, also yeah, implement, uh, like you said, and invest. And the way I threw it out there was like, do, do the homework, do the work that comes with the therapy, not just the therapy itself. Um, and if you don't do that, if you just go and talk and never put it into action, you can be guaranteed that it won't work. And then you said, uh, also just that, that support, as is, is huge. So if you don't have a support system, if you don't have friends, if you don't have maybe family members who can walk with you or mentors as well, then you can guarantee that it, it won't work. Um, but if you do, it's going to, like you said, um, the healing is going to happen faster, uh, w- which is really beautiful and, and really encouraging as well. The other one I would just add here, picking up on something you said is kind of building in some, you, you talked about prioritizing. And I think in order to prioritize, you need to build some cushion into your life, which I'm the worst at. So I'm talking to myself and you guys all get to listen, but, um, but it can be so easy to, especially if you're kind of like this type A, like overachiever type to just like kind of pack your day and your life with like, I'm going from this thing to this thing to this thing and doing this task and working on this project. And it's like, cool. You know, you're going to wake up at the end of life and you're going to be like, man, I, kind of destroyed myself. That's not the purpose of life is just to be productive. And so I think if we want to become um, more human, become more virtuous, become uh, more loving and live like richer, happier lives, it's really important not to have um, our schedules like constantly booked. Like we need some of that cushion or margin um, to give us the ability to, you know, do the homework from therapy or just to enjoy like beautiful experiences and do those things that really give us life. And I think we, especially as Americans, maybe everyone else listening who's not in the States, like is better at this. I know Europeans listening, like you guys are way better at this than we are. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I've, I've noticed that that's necessary as well. Awesome. Yeah. And I just have a few thoughts about what you said. One is Please. I, this is just like a, a little thing and also from my supervisor at Franciscan, but he didn't like to use the word homework. Um, and I've kind of adopted that from him. Instead, I'll use challenge. And I, I like it. Pushing back. Yeah, I like this. Yeah, Go ahead. I like it because like I always tell people, I'm not grading you. If you don't want to mm-hmm. do something, you don't find that you do it. Let's try something else because we really want it to be something you can implement and use in your life. Like not just now, but like long term so like beautiful like something i often use is a common cognitive behavioral therapy tool called thought records super simple but super helpful (laughs) i could talk all about that but um sometimes people don't do it and don't like it and i'm like great like just be honest and we'll try something else because there are other strategies but i like the word Mm -hmm. challenge because really what we're trying to do is just grow into more into more wholeness into more of who God made you to be into more of freedom and peace. Um, so challenges is what helps us grow. <laughs> Beautiful. No, I like that. And that's a way better way to say it, especially with when you have the grading aspect, that's not, not super helpful. So I, I totally agree. Thanks for um, clarifying that. I really appreciate it. Um, the thought record thing, would you explain that a little bit? Oh yeah, sure. <laughs> oh man, I could talk a whole podcast about this. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it's basically a short structured journal entry. Um, and like the one I, if you Googled it, you'd find a bunch of different templates. Cause it really is a very common tool in cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, but the one I like is just simple, like from therapistaid.com or .org or whatever. <laughs> and it just has, um, you write down the situation, thought, emotion, behavior, and then an alternative thought. And I tell people like a good time to do a thought record is if you notice like I'm overthinking or I'm caught in a thought spiral or or I feel a big emotion, like I feel super anxious. Maybe like I even feel it in my body, like my my chest is tight, my stomach's churning. Like those are kind of red flags of like, this is a good time to do a thought record (laughs) and kind of, and and there's so many benefits. Like I really could talk a lot about it, but (laughs) just to be brief, like one is it can stop like the thought spiral and be that space to just reflect before you go down that rabbit hole, (laughs) which can, which in cognitive behavioral therapy, like through evidence-based research, they've concluded that our thoughts and emotions are congruent. So that means that um, if I can 
stop unhelpful or untrue thoughts, that impacts my emotion and my mood. So I can change my mood by becoming more aware of my thoughts and not engaging as much in unhelpful or untrue thoughts. Um, and a thought record is a tool to do that. Um, and, and then just one final note on that <laughs> is, yeah, yeah, please. um, doing it also can be really good content to bring to therapy because sometimes for some people it's harder to like remember what thoughts or remember or even articulate like I had a really hard day and I don't even know I don't have the language but actually I wrote it down <laughs> and sometimes for internal processors it's actually really helpful um, and I've seen it like help not only moment thoughts like we call them automatic thoughts. So those are like the first layer of thoughts and cognitive behavioral therapy. And then there's beneath those are like irrational beliefs, which are is exactly what it sounds like. It's irrational, not true, but I really believe it. Yeah, <laughs> um, it sounds so good. Like, and that's usually like under that is core belief. So it's basically irrational beliefs I've had my whole life, usually from wounds and because we, and we all have them because we live in an imperfect world. Um, so thought records can help you change automatic thoughts that you, so that you can then change emotions and behaviors related to it, but it can also help you detect irrational beliefs so that you can bring that to your therapy session and further unpack what's under this. Like what layers of wounds do I have that make me believe this thing that I know isn't true? <laughs> so good. No, I really like that. Both, um, the thought record and, you know, what you just mentioned to the different layers of, of thoughts and beliefs. That's su super helpful, super good. And it's crazy how if you, there's a lot of people talk about beliefs that I think it kind of becomes this thing that people tone out to a bit. Um, but I think it is, it's so, so important because if you bust just like one of those untrue beliefs, it can totally change the way that you approach life um, to the point where I've seen people, I remember talking with a friend who, is a physical therapist and he, you know, broke into running his own business, like, which is not an easy thing to do being an entrepreneur. And, um, there were certain beliefs that he had, which sounds kind of, again, kind of superficial hokey, but it's not when you see it in action that once he kind of addressed those and be like, man, I, you know, always thought uh, th this way about like me and running a business. And once he was able to break through that, his business started like growing and he started to be able to succeed in the whole entrepreneurial thing, which is really, really beautiful. So there are concrete examples. It's not just some this, you know, again, like vague thing that you just swirl your head around all the time. And I'm not saying you're saying that, but I think a lot of times when people hear us talking about this, they, they think that that's it. No, it's like, it can be very concrete in your own life if you bust those, you know, kind of untrue beliefs. Absolutely. And we could talk a lot more <laughs> about that too. Um, yeah. I just, I love cognitive behavioral therapy and it's, it's what helped me and what I really yeah. just find to be so, um, impactful with my clients. I like that. Yeah. And I think sometimes it gets a bad rap. Um, people maybe reduce it to just like thought, uh, talk therapy. Um, but I think it, yeah, from what you're sharing now, there's so much more to it as well. And I have benefited from it too. I've benefited from other therapy models as well, but, um, I have benefited from, uh, CBT. So thank you, um, for, for going through all of that. Any final items that you wanted to touch on when it comes to how to make, uh, therapy fruitful? Uh, back to when you were summarizing it, um, you had summarized like support helps, um, yeah, just expedite the process. Um, and I just wanted to add that like, if you don't have support, that's okay. Like you can work with your therapist on how can I get creative and build my support? And sometimes that's a great place to start. Um, and you've already come to therapy, so you have that support and, and building it can make a huge difference. So that's a lot of what we do often in therapy too, is if people don't have good supports or if they're not opening up to their good supports and don't feel comfortable sharing, it's like, how can we work to get there? Really good. And I think a lot of people might be afraid too that they would maybe develop some unhealthy dependency on people in their lives. But that's the beauty of what you just said. It's like you can actually learn how to have like an appropriate, like interdependent relationship that's not over relying 
uh, on that person on the other end. And it can be really life-giving on both ends, which is really beautiful. And I've seen that and I've lived that and it's, it's, it can be so good. So I love that you said that. And the, the only other thing that came to mind related to the first point of just showing up is starting. I think maybe of showing up as like the ongoing effort, whereas I think starting is like just turning the key to, you know, get the engine going. And that I think is probably the hardest part in my opinion, Claire, like there's so many barriers that we have in our minds when it comes to therapy. We, there's so many things that we maybe even just like barriers that we create ourselves because for one reason or another, we don't want to go there. Um, but man, if you could just get started, if you can just like, experiment. Um, I think that is really, really helpful. And that's one of the ways I trick myself into doing things often is, uh, and I'm curious if you have any tips for this too, but I'll, I'll just trick myself into thinking like, Oh, you know what? Um, I'm just going to kind of put on this like experimenters hat or lab coat and just be like, you know, I'm just gonna try it. I'm going to do one time and see how that goes. And then I'll go from there. Um, and, and I've noticed that that will get me moving way more than if I think of the totality of it, it, because it feels too heavy and too big. Um, but I can, you know, hone in on the one little piece that just very next step and not really think about the overall effort. At least that's been helpful for me. So curious about, uh, for you, like what tips or hacks do you have about just getting started? Yeah, I mean, I love what you just said. And actually, that's the language my supervisor now uses. He's like, let's hmm. try an experiment. <laughs> and I think, too, like, we talk a lot about overwhelm. Like, I feel overwhelmed. And like, what do I do with that? Because it feels like I don't know what to do with that. And the the really, I think, <laughs> the way to combat it is one step at a time. Because if it's super overwhelming, if I start taking steps, just start start experimenting pretty soon it's going to be less overwhelming but it's that like okay it feels overwhelming maybe there's anxiety so I avoid it that's going to make it grow because <laughs> you're not doing the things you need to do to make it decrease um, and I also think on your point that it's just it's such a good outlook to like be um, willing to not be great at things like to just experiment and try new things like how much more full can your life be if you're willing to get out of your comfort zone? Boom. So good. And I, um, I don't know if this is great, but I call that like willingness to suck. Like just being like really willing to be like, Hey, you know, I'm going to look ridiculous. And this kind of maybe fits under the point of humility, but I'm going to look ridiculous. I'm going to sound ridiculous. People might even make fun of me or judge me, but I'm just willing to be bad at this to start. And if you're willing to go through that discomfort, what I've realized in life, whether it's in like business or fitness or anything, managing your money, um, you're going to get further than the people who are criticizing you. Not that it's a competition. I'm not like saying you want to beat everyone down or anything like that. But those opinions are often the things that I think hold us back. And so I think if you grow that muscle of just, hey, I'm not going to be good at this right away. I'm not going to be a pro. How how would I be a pro at this? I'm starting out fresh. Like who can expect that? And I think if you take that um, mindset, I guess, into, into it, I think you can get way, way further faster than if you kind of think about it forever and never actually take the first step. Absolutely. And <laughs> I love what you're saying because I have that same similar mindset and have to remind myself to have that mindset. Like I have a Rocky Balboa <laughs> quote of like, you ain't going to have a life till you start believing in yourself. Um, and then another good quote, um, actually from Brene's Brown, Brene Brown's book, Daring Greatly is Theodore Roosevelt's quote. And it's kind of longer, but it's about the man in the arena. And it's like the one in it, like getting bloody, <laughs> like doing it. Like there's so much more respect for him, even if he fails than someone who doesn't try. Love that. I absolutely love that quote. And yeah, so good. So maybe we'll attach this to this episode somehow. We'll, we'll have to, my team and I will figure that out. But Claire, I know we're um, almost out of time here. Any final thoughts or anything you'd add about making therapy uh, fruitful? Yeah, maybe I'll just end with some Bible verses that kind of I bring up a lot in therapy. Um, so even if you're not, um, religious, like just, I would just encourage you to have an open mind, but, um, yeah, kind of the top three ones that I bring up a lot are first John 11, which is God is light and in him, there is no darkness at all. And I think I love this because it's just like, there's so much beauty that comes when you bring things to the light. 
And that's where the healing begins. Like you can't, a doctor can't heal anything, heal something that he can't see or that you're not showing him, you're not presenting him. So I think similar with like mental health, like just bringing it to the light, like, ooh, that's a huge first step. Um, and then the next one is Romans 8, 28 in, in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, which I think just, oh, I love this <laughs> because like, it just validates that no matter what you've done, um, he can make it good. And like, like my story, like he's transfigured it for beauty and your story, like, look at what you're doing with your story. And and anyone listening, like he wants to bring whatever you've done. And always, like if you come back to him, if you come back to truth, um, it can be used for good. And like the the saying, heal people, heal people. Um, so there's just so much hope in that, I think. And then the last one is 2 Corinthians 12, 9, just my power is made perfect in weakness and that's God's power. So just it's in our brokenness that he can work the most. So like our brokenness is good, <laughs> which is kind of nuts. <laughs> um, but yeah, those are uh, kind of my top three Bible verses, I'd say. Beautiful. Well, thanks for sharing all that. And yeah, definitely moving. And I love that quote, you know, heal people, heal people. That's super, super good. Um, man, Claire, thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, if people want to do therapy with you, I know you're in Colorado, um, how do they find you online? How do they start that process? Yes. So you can call our main office at St. Raphael's and request me. That'd be great. I have openings, love, would love to work with you. Um, find it such a joy. Um, and then we also have, um, our website, um, which I'm not going to remember, but maybe we can put in the show notes. I think it's like St. Raphael counseling.com. Um, and you can look up all our therapists. We have really, a really solid team of therapists. So if I'm not like the right personality for you, I, I'm pretty sure there could be someone on our team that is. Beautiful. Love that. And then I'd love for you just in closing to speak to all of our listeners who come from broken families. What maybe final piece of encouragement or advice would you give to them, especially if they just feel stuck and so broken because of all the trauma and the brokenness in their families? Mm, yeah. Wow. I mean, I really love your book. <laughs> and I think like them just having the resources you've provided can really validate a lot of probably the experiences they have. Um, I know I actually have a few clients reading your book and they've expressed that. And I think just, yeah, like <laughs> the title of your book, It's Not Your Fault. And and starting there, like I think you've really got to the heart of the issue because it allows them, allows someone to yeah, really delve into like, okay, this did affect me. And this really maybe deeply affected me because, yeah, for so many reasons that we could go into. But um, yeah, I think just knowing there's hope, there's healing, um, and, and taking advantage of the resources out there that like you have provided and therapy, um, and knowing that, that there's, there's just so much hope. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Again, if you're in Colorado, you can find Claire and the other therapists at her practice by going to straphaelcounseling.com or just clicking the link in the show notes. Uh, on that page, actually, if you click appointments, you can actually get a free, I think it's a 50-minute consult uh, for free, which is awesome. And so my apologies if in the future that changes after this recording, but for now, you can get a free consult if you go to that page. And to recap this episode, I just want to go through those 10 tips again. Uh, the first is to just show up, right? To show up, to put in the work. Uh, if you don't show up, you don't put in the work, you're guaranteed to fail. The next thing is to be honest and vulnerable. If you're closed off, if you're not honest, if you lie, if you deceive, you're not going to get much out of therapy. It's not going to work for you. Number three is be humble. Be humble. If you're arrogant and prideful and egotistical, therapy is not going to work for you. You need to go and be honest that you, you know life isn't the way you want it to be. You feel broken and you need help. Number four is be courageous. Like therapy's hard. It takes courage. But I love this uh, quote, it, you know, courage is not the absence of fear. It's acting in spite of your fear. And so be courageous. It's not a place to be cowardly. Uh, if you want to, you know, shrink back from challenges, therapy is not for you. But if you're ready to step up uh, and to go at it and, and know that you'll have the support of the therapist, you're not, you don't have to like, you know, grow all this bravery on your own. 
But if you go at it, be courageous, put in the hard work, you're going to see benefits from it. So that's number four. Five is to be open-minded. You might be challenged in ways that you never thought. You might be challenged to, you know, address parts of your past or your woundedness in a way that you never thought you might need to or be able to, but be open-minded and you'd be surprised at how much you're capable of. That's number five. Six is implement and invest in the challenges. So remember we said we're not going to call it homework, but we're going to call it challenges. Those challenges are really the key to making therapy effective. Uh, Number seven is build cushion into your life. Like we need some cushion in our lives, which I'm horrible at, but I'm going to work on to be able to, to grow, to grow personally, to build virtue, to heal our woundedness, our brokenness, and um, be able to move on in life. Because if our schedules are packed and our to-do lists are super long and we're always focused on that, we're not going to do that hard work that often takes a lot of energy, a lot of emotional focus uh, in order to heal. And so number eight is uh, build support around you. Build support around you. You can't do it alone. Like if you want to guarantee failure, you know, do it alone. Um, number nine is start as an experiment start as an experiment. It can be so intimidating to do everything at once. And so don't do that. Just start as an experiment, do a little bit at once, you know, go to one session, do the free consult, see how it goes. Maybe it doesn't work for you. I don't know. Um, but then, you know, every time just think of it as a little bit of an experiment, a little bit of a bet and go from there. And number 10 is be willing to suck or or be bad at it. That's so important with anything in life. You're not going to attain any sort of a skill unless you're willing to not be great at the skill when you start. Like who is exceptional? Very few people are really great at um, any skill when they just start. And so again, show up is number one. Two is be honest and vulnerable. Three is be humble. Four, be courageous. uh, Five, be open-minded. Six, uh, implement and invest in the challenges. Seven, build cushion into your life. Eight, um, build support around you. Don't do it alone. Uh, Nine, start as an experiment. And 10, be willing to suck or be bad at it. Also, I absolutely love the quote that Claire mentioned from Teddy Roosevelt, uh, the man in the arena. And I wanted to share that in a second. But first, if you're not in Colorado and you still want a counselor, a spiritual director, a coach, a mentor, uh, we can help. We know how difficult and time consuming that can be. But thankfully, here at Restored, we're building a resource for you. We're building a network of counselors, therapists, spiritual directors, mentors that we trust, that we vet, that we recommend. And it's just going to save you time. And you're going to have confidence that you know you're finding someone who's competent, who's professional. And so how do you get on the wait list? Just go to Restored restoredministry.com slash coaching and restoredministry.com slash coaching, or just click on the link in the show notes, fill out the form on that page. And then once we find someone for you, then we'll connect you with them. Again, go to restoredministry.com slash coaching, or just click on the link in the show notes. And here's the quote from Teddy Roosevelt titled The Man in the Arena. It goes like this. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. So good. And with that, that wraps up this episode. If you know someone who's struggling because of their parents' divorce or their broken family, share this episode with them. Seriously, feel free to take like 30 seconds now to message them if you want. And in closing, always remember, you are not alone. We're here to help you feel whole again and break that cycle of dysfunction and divorce in your own life. And keep in mind the words of C.S. Lewis who said, you can't go back and change the beginning, but you can start where you are and change the ending. 